Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the Cartronics third quarter 2020 earnings conference call. At this time, all participant lines are in listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you'll need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today. Brad Conrad, thank you. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to Cartronics third quarter 2020 conference call. On the call today, we have Ed West, Chief Executive Officer, and Gary Ferreira, Chief Financial Officer. We will start with prepared remarks and then take questions. Before we begin, a cautionary statement regarding forward-looking information. During the course of this call, we will make certain forward-looking statements regarding future events, results, or performance. Any forward-looking statements made on this call are subject to risks and uncertainties, including, but not limited to, events, market conditions, and other risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially. Please refer to our earnings release and our reports filed with the SEC, including our Form 10-K for the year ended December 31, 2019, as updated by our Form 10-Qs this year, which describe forward-looking statements and risk factors and other events that could impact future results and other factors that could impact our business. The statements on this call are made as of the date of this call and are based on current information and may be outdated at the time of any replay of this call. We assume no obligation to update any forward-looking statements made today to reflect events that occur or circumstances that exist after the date on which they are made. In addition, during the course of this call, we, we will reference certain non-GAAP financial performance measures our opinion regarding the usefulness of such measures, together with the reconciliation of such measures to the nearest gap measure, is included in the earnings release issued this afternoon and available on our website. We have also posted supplemental investor materials regarding the quarterly results, along with additional information on the investor relations page of our website at cartronics.com. We will make reference to some of the pages in this earnings supplement during the course of today's call. With that, I will turn the call over to Ed. Great. Thank you, Brad. Uh, it's great to be with you today, and I look forward to sharing some recent developments that are transforming several key aspects of our business. The key messages that I would like to convey today are as follows. First, the business continues to recover from the impacts from the pandemic, and we are executing on our growth strategy. As evidenced by today's announcements, FIs and fintechs of all sizes are partnering with Cartronics to deliver both an efficient cash solution and a physical brand presence by leveraging our unparalleled network and platform. We believe we are well positioned to benefit from the secular trend for FIs and fintechs to leverage common infrastructure to serve their customers' cash needs. Second, our investments in technology are paying dividends by opening new business opportunities and driving down costs. We have taken control over our future product flexibility by controlling and integrating the hardware, software, and processing capabilities. We believe this will result in accelerated product development, margin expansion, capital efficiency, and greater free cash flow conversion going forward. And third, speaking of cash flow, the free cash flow generated by this business is strong, and we expect this to grow over time as we continue to evolve Cartronics. Our recent investments have fundamentally changed the capital profile of the business and consequently, the free cash flow conversion has improved significantly. Now, let me start with a brief recap of the results for the quarter. Revenues for the quarter were $279 million, and adjusted EBITDA was $72 million. While our third quarter results were down versus prior year due to the continued impacts from the pandemic, the results were up significantly on a sequential basis from the second quarter as we saw continuing recovery across our markets. Our U.S. business recovered to nearly flat year-over-year year on ATM operating revenues. As you can see on page 5 of the supplement, we saw continued recovery of our same-store transactions, which were actually up 1% for the quarter in the U.S. We also deployed nearly 700 new ATMs at Casey's stores during the quarter and experienced continued sequential revenue growth in our managed services and surcharge-free categories. Outside the U.S., our businesses continue to be more impacted by various local restrictions that have been implemented as a result of the pandemic. 
As a reminder, we also have more exposure to travel, tourism, and leisure in the markets outside of the U.S. People, though, will eventually travel again, and we will lead to upside opportunity for us. The third quarter results allowed us to generate strong adjusted free cash flow for the quarter of $56 million, which was up from $48 million in the prior year. Free cash flow has been a consistent focus for us as we prudently deploy capital. It's fairly remarkable that on a current valuation basis, our free cash flow yield is over 18%. If you look at our cash flows over time, as reflected on page 11 in the supplement, we have consistently delivered solid free cash flows year in and year out. That has continued this year in spite of the impact of the pandemic. I'll come back to this in a few minutes, but we are optimistic that we can continue to grow our free cash flows through growth and lower capital intensity as we gain market share and leverage our recent transformative investments. I've talked extensively about the dynamics in consumer banking over the past several quarters, and we continue to see signs of accelerating digital transformation. Within the past few weeks, several large banks announced plans to significantly reduce their branch footprints, some of them by as much as 20%. As banks continue to pull back on their physical infrastructure, many of them are leveraging our network and platform to continue to provide convenient and cost-effective cash services to their customers. Our solutions and capabilities are valuable to not only small community banks and fintech startups, but also the largest banks in the country. During the quarter, we continued our growth with fintech partners. We recently established a relationship with Chime, a leading fintech built on protecting its members and helping them get ahead. We're pleased that Chime has chosen to join our all-point network at ATMs at select U.S. retailers to broaden the scope of convenient and surcharge-free cash access that will be available to its members in the coming year. We also established a relationship with Credit Karma, the consumer technology platform with more than 100 million members in the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. We are pleased that Credit Karma has also chosen to join our all-point network to broaden the scope of convenient and surcharge-free cash access available to its members. Additionally, we established relationships with Mocafi and Central Payments, who have also both joined Allpoint to broaden their services for their customers. The team has done a terrific job of building on our recent successes of expanding with Fintex, which will likely drive future transaction growth with these digital partners. Allpoint has definitely become the partner of choice with the digital operators and builds on our strong reputation among our growing base of 1,200 issuers driving Allpoint. These relationships continue to serve as strong proof points that our convenient, on-demand network and nationwide footprint provide the surcharge-free solution that FinTechs and FIs need and consumers want. We continue to see strong growth in transaction volume from our FinTech partners, as reflected on page 9 of the earnings supplement. Q3 transactions involving these partners are up over 200% since the beginning of the year. Fintechs now recognize that convenient, secure, and surcharge-free access to cash remains very important to their customers and critical to their customer engagement and growth plans. Increasingly, we are seeing a trend from larger banks to leverage our platform and look for ways to reduce costs or grow more cost-effectively. Our managed service solution for operating ATMs continues to gain market tra traction and now increasingly with larger financial institutions. Last year, we initiated a relationship with U.S. Bank to brand approximately 80 ATMs in Charlotte, and we're thrilled to report that we are now expanding this partnership with our first managed services agreement with U.S. Bank. We'll own and operate about 70 off-branch ATMs. We're excited about our growing partnership with U.S. Bank as we continue to earn their trust to further build and expand on this relationship. Additionally, Building on our partnership in Canada, we have significantly expanded our relationship with Scotiabank in Mexico, where we are adding an additional 200 ATMs that we will manage for them. These deployments are in process now and are expected to be completed by the end of the year. We have also agreed to operate an additional 200 ATMs for Scotia in 2021. This is helping drive their branch transformation strategy strategy as they look to optimize their footprint and deliver superior service for their customers. 
Beyond these relationships, we also entered into numerous other branding, all point, and managed services arrangements this past quarter with both new and existing partners. Our value proposition continues to resonate with a wide variety of FIs, including national, regional, and community issuers. FIs are looking to grow strategically, but also optimize their costs and customer offerings. Our portfolio of solutions can help them with both their growth and cost optimization initiatives. Now, moving on to our international segments. With the exception of South Africa, our businesses outside of the U.S. have been more impacted and have been slower to recover than our U.S. business. This is partly attributable to the nature of the ATM locations, but also attributable to the tighter restrictions in different markets. In our second largest market, the U.K., same-store transactions are down, in percentage terms, in the low to mid-30s range versus the prior year while our cash dispensed amounts are only down in the teens on a per ATM basis. Cash continues to demonstrate resilience despite the recent lockdowns. In a report published earlier this month, Link said that in April, people still withdrew about 1 billion pounds a week from ATMs. In August, this rose by 50% to 1.5 billion pounds per week. With our broad network and coverage of ATMs and premium locations, we continue to benefit from the strength of the cash economy in the UK. In addition, the UK government and the payment services regulator have launched programs that indicate there could be legislation in the next parliament protecting access to cash. As the UK's largest employer, Cartronics is well positioned to capture the incremental volume as the market in the UK recovers and travel eventually resumes. We believe that our integrated platform and leading national footprint in the UK will result in new solutions to serve the payments ecosystem. Meanwhile, our business in South Africa continues to accelerate. September was a record month for installations and our volumes and average transaction value are ahead of those reported in the first quarter of 2020. Earlier this year, I mentioned a significant milestone achievement for Cartronics the development of our own proprietary ATM operating software. We're excited about this advancement in our company. I will refer you to page 10 in the supplement. This technology, now live on over 15,000 of our ATMs in the U.S., is transforming our business in two important ways. One, it has unlocked new growth opportunities, and two, it has improved the, the capital intensity of the business. We expect this technology to be deployed on nearly 20,000 ATMs by the end of the year, representing more than half of our U.S.-owned ATM footprint. This proprietary ATM software, developed in-house, includes a suite of ATM applications that provides us greater control and speed to market while enhancing functionality and improved security. This bundle of applications, that we refer to as the NeoSuite platform, enables us to quickly integrate and scale mobile solutions and other products. By leveraging an integrated mobile API in our new ATM application, we are effectively creating a gateway that significantly expands the transactional capabilities of the ATM, potentially including things like bill pay, prepaid, or even cryptocurrency and other financial transactions. Our new suite of applications also allows us to provide our partners with detailed analytics into how their customers engage with our ATMs, enabling near real-time marketing engagement opportunities and protecting the entire experience, all with best-in-class security embedded directly into the software stack. The NeoSuite platform is delivering enhanced operational and financial control over our ATM estate on a remote basis and we are already starting to realize lower operating costs through fewer physical maintenance visits, lower software maintenance costs, and enhanced uptime. In addition, this platform allows us to gain more control over our capital investments, whether it is a software change along the lines of Windows 10, a network change like EMV, or a compliance-related change. Our capital costs are expected to be lower as we can update our ATMs remotely without involvement from third parties. We think this enhanced software platform delivers a step change in our ATM evolution. We are rolling the software out initially in the U.S. and Canada and plan to expand the deployment globally, starting with our second largest market in the U.K. next year. 
In summary, it was a solid quarter across our enterprise in light of the ongoing negative impacts to our transactions from the pandemic. This is highlighted by strong operational execution, strong free cash flows, and expanded new business with financial institutions and fintech partners. Now, in spite of the continued rhetoric that we all hear, cash remains a large and very important portion of the payments ecosystem in the economies where we operate. Consumers trust cash and value its unique attributes of reliability, security, and privacy. Now for the facts. Cash in circulation in the U.S. achieved a major milestone, surpassing $2 trillion in August and up over 14% for the third quarter versus the prior year. As reflected on page 8, our dispense levels in the U.S. were up 13% for the quarter versus prior year. This data is further supported by recent direct-to-consumer research by the Fed, and Javelin and Mercator, which all indicate that consumers' desire for and interest in using cash has not changed during the pandemic and payment choice is highly valued. In another, another interesting stat, the Fed recently placed an order for 2021 paper currency production that calls for a 30 to 65% increase in note production versus 2020. This is a clear testament to the expected increase in the use of cash by the Federal Reserve Bank. All of this also reflects how critical cash is for our most vulnerable segments of the population, particularly during this pandemic. This is a good reminder that our nationwide cash infrastructure has never been more important than it is today for this large and growing segment of cash-dependent consumers, many of whom are either under or unbanked. It gives our employees immense pride by delivering on our purpose as a company, which is providing convenient, safe, and reliable cash access in the communities we serve. I will now turn the call over to Gary for additional details on the quarter and a look toward the fourth quarter. Thank you, Ed. I will start with a quick recap of our financial performance in the third quarter, followed by a discussion of our balance sheet and liquidity before moving on to what we are currently experiencing and what could happen over the next few months. The comparative financial metrics provided are on a constant currency basis to neutralize the slight currency tailwind we experienced during the quarter. The COVID-19 pandemic and the related restrictions on consumers continue to impact us during the third quarter. Total revenues of $279.4 million were down 21% for the quarter. Adjusted EBITDA of $71.9 million was down 19%. Adjusted EBITDA margin was 25.7%. I'd like to highlight that during the quarter, we recognized 11.8 million of net UK business rate recoveries. You might remember that on our last earnings call, I mentioned the recent legal decision by the Supreme Court in the United Kingdom removing business rates in England and Wales, effectively a form of property tax for certain ATMs. We have been pleased with the speed at which we've been recovering amounts owed to us and anticipate recovering a slightly higher amount in Q4. Adjusting out these UK business rate recoveries, we delivered adjusted EBITDA of approximately $60 million for the quarter, which is up nearly 30% sequentially from $47 million in the second quarter. This sequential improvement is mostly attributable to improved transactions across all of our regions relative to the second quarter. Partially offset by suspension of the temporary compensation expense savings measures we put in place in Q2. Even with the suspension of these compensation-related cost control measures and excluding the business rate recoveries, we delivered an adjusted EBITDA margin of 21.5%, up from 20% in Q2. These strong margins in the underlying business, along with the UK business rate recoveries, and a network and capital benefit driven in part by an $8 million income tax refund we received during the quarter drove adjusted free cash flow to $56 million, allowing us to reduce net debt by $53 million compared to the end of June. To round out our key consolidated performance metrics, adjusted EPS was $0.49 cents for the quarter, up sequentially from $0.13 cents in Q2, but down compared to $0.79 cents in Q3 last year. The decline in adjusted EPS compared to Q3 last year was driven by the decline in EBITDA and higher interest expense. Looking at our financial results by segment, North America remains the most resilient. 
as revenue and adjusted EBITDA were both down 15% year over year. During the quarter, with continued strength in our bank branding and surcharge free offerings, plus new ATM deployments, we almost returned to flat on the top line for the quarter in our core U.S. ATM operating business. While our smaller businesses in Canada and Mexico and our merchant processing businesses continue to recover more slowly and were each down over 30% for the quarter. Canada and Mexico both have a much higher percentage of casino and leisure-oriented ATMs compared to the U.S., and many of these ATMs remain non-operating or are operating on a very limited basis. For the third quarter, U.S. same-store withdrawal transactions increased 1%. As shown in the earnings supplement on page 5, this measure of same-store transactions is more aligned with the metric that we reported prior to the pandemic and illustrates the trend at our transacting company-owned ATMs. For comparability purposes, we have also shown the COVID-adjusted same-store metric, which we've provided since March, and was a negative 3% for Q3. As a reminder, this lower same-store metric includes temporarily non-transacting ATM to illustrate the impact of temporary pandemic-related site closures on our U.S. business. As illustrated on page 7 of the earnings supplement, our bank branding and surcharge-free network revenues, almost all of which are in North America, continue to grow and were up 8% year-over-year in the third quarter. This growth continues to be driven by new and existing FI partners and our expanding list of fintech partners. We have a relatively high percentage of variable costs in our North America segment. This dynamic, along with focused cost savings and growth from new and existing partners on our network, drove a solid adjusted EBITDA result in light of the lower transaction-based revenues. We were able to keep our North America adjusted EBITDA margin flat compared to Q3 last year at 26%, as growth in our higher margin revenue categories, such as bank branding and surcharge free, along with continued cost controls, delivered a solid margin result in light of the overall transaction and revenue declines. Our Europe and Africa segment saw the steepest revenue decline, down 35%, while EBITDA was down 20% from Q3 last year. The transaction decline rates improved sequentially from Q2, as shown on page 6 of the earnings supplement. The largest component of this segment is our UK business, which was down about 33% on same-store transaction volume, which was a solid improvement from the 50% decline in Q2. However, as we've seen across many geographies, the UK has recently implemented more restrictions and new guidance on social gatherings, and we've recently seen the transaction decline rates flatten out in the low to mid-30% range. We continue to see a significant decline in our cross-border revenues in this segment, as travel and tourism remains very limited. Our high-margin cross-border revenues were down $11 million in this segment compared to the prior year. Q3 adjusted EBITDA in a Europe and Africa segment was positively impacted by the previously mentioned UK business rate recoveries of $11.8 million. In our smallest segment, at approximately 7% of revenues, Australia and New Zealand revenue declined 25% from Q3 2019, while EBITDA declined 37%. The travel, tourism, and leisure sectors were hit particularly hard in this segment throughout Q3. However, transactions across location types steadily improved during the quarter. Moving to liquidity in the balance sheet on page 12 of the earnings supplement, at the end of the third quarter, we had total gross debt outstanding of $914 million and had unrestricted cash of $263 million, resulting in net debt of approximately $651 million. As a reminder, we have $116 million principal amount outstanding on our remaining convertible notes, which mature on December 1st. We plan to settle the remaining notes with cash on hand, with over $250 million of unrestricted cash and zero outstanding on our $600 million revolving credit facility, we have substantial liquidity and we also expect to continue to generate strong cash flows in the foreseeable future. Net debt outstanding of $651 million at the end of Q3 was down $53 million sequentially from the end of Q2. Our net leverage ratio, as defined in the revolving credit facility, was 2.6 times at the end of Q3, 
improved from 2.7 times at the end of Q2. We continue to have significant headroom under our revolver covenants. Moving on to capital expenditures, year to date, our capital expenditures were 61 million, down 32% from 90 million during the first nine months of 2019. We believe that the recent trends in capital expenditures reflect a material decrease in the capital intensity of the business. These improvements are driven by technology enhancements, such as our NeoSuite platform, and operational improvements that we implemented prior to and during the pandemic. To be clear, we are not compromising growth through this rebaselining of capital requirements. To highlight this point further, we expect to purchase 3,000 more ATMs than in 2019, despite spending significantly less in CapEx this year. As Ed previously mentioned, across the company, we have prioritized delivering strong free cash flow. Looking at page 11 of the supplement, you can clearly see that in the results these last few years. And with our improvements in technology and a focus on enhancing our operational and strategic outsourcing or strategic sourcing efforts, we have driven down the capital intensity of the business. For many years, CapEx was 10 to 12 percent of revenues. In 2019, CapEx was 9 percent of revenues, while CapEx has been 8 percent of revenues over the last 12 months, even with revenues being impacted by the pandemic. At our investor day back in March 2019, in our medium term outlook, we estimated annual CapEx to approximate 8 to 10 percent of revenues. Due to the previously mentioned technology improvements in enhanced strategic sourcing, we now expect annual CapEx to approximate 7 percent of revenues over the medium term. As we navigate through this pandemic, we have not provided formal guidance. However, we feel it is important to be as transparent as possible as to what we are currently experiencing and our expectations for the remainder of the year. Based on recent transaction trends and commercial wins in execution, our current estimate for our fourth quarter is an adjusted EBITDA amount excluding UK business rate recoveries similar to the 60 million we experienced in the third quarter. Ordinarily, Q4 is seasonally weaker than Q3. And while we have seen some recent new unit and branding growth, some of this growth may be offset by seasonal factors, and in some cases, retightening of social restrictions. This estimate does not assume any further significant lockdowns beyond what we have recently seen. And on the other hand, we are not assuming any significant loosening of social restrictions across our geographies. Based on the additional business rates that we have already received in October, Along with reasonable assumptions of continued recoveries, we could see business rate recoveries in Q4 in the $15 to $20 million range, which would put us at a total adjusted EBITDA number of about $75 to $80 million for the fourth quarter. As I mentioned earlier in the year, we renegotiated and extended several contracts in North America on slightly different terms, which caused a portion of the revenues related to these contracts to convert from a gross revenue recognition basis to a net basis. This change is expected to cause a $6 million revenue reduction in Q4, but no reduction to EBITDA. This change could cause up to $20 million revenue impact in 2021, and again, no impact to EBITDA. At about $75 to $80 million in Q4 adjusted EBITDA, and taking into consideration the change in revenue recognition that I just mentioned, we'd expect an adjusted EBITDA margin approaching 30%. Turning to CapEx, we now expect to spend approximately $90 million in capital expenditures for the full year 2020. This would approximate 8% of revenues and would be weighted about equally between growth CapEx and maintenance and infrastructure CapEx. We expect to see continued solid free cash flow in Q4 and could end the year with net debt of approximately $620 million, which would bring us back down towards the upper end of our previously stated target leverage range of two to two and a half times. I'd like to take a moment to highlight our strong free cash flow generation. Even during the worst of the pandemic, we managed to continue to generate free cash flow and pay down debt. Highlighted on page 12 of the supplement, since the beginning of 2018, we've generated $678 million in adjusted net cash provided by operating activities. 
we have invested $293 million of this amount back into the business. The remaining balance of $385 million in adjusted free cash flow has allowed us to decrease, decrease net debt by $258 million, repurchase $67 million worth of shares, and complete small acquisitions or other financing activities. Our strong cash generation provides a lot of flexibility going forward, and between already contracted new business and our growing business opportunities, we are positioning ourselves for growth in 2021 and beyond. Let me conclude by saying that the company is well positioned both financially and strategically to not only weather this pandemic, but to emerge even stronger. We are encouraged by our new business wins, favorable market dynamics, and our recent investments in technology that are helping create new growth levers and lower capital and operating costs. The business has proven to be resilient, and we are excited about the opportunities ahead. Now let me turn it back to Ed for some final thoughts. Thank you, Gary. Let me summarize today by emphasizing our conviction in this business and our plans for growth. First, the business continues to recover from the pandemic and we continue to execute on new business. We find ourselves at a rare tipping point where pundits question the long-term prospects for cash. This, in turn, actually leads to an acceleration of our business growth plans as FIs leverage our unique surcharge-free network and outsourcing platform. When looking through the lens of digital transformation, we believe we're at the beginning of a secular trend and Cartronics is the optimal partner for FIs of all sizes, fintechs, and premier retailers. Again, we believe this is a significant market opportunity for us whereby we own about 10% of the ATMs in the United States, but only have a 3.5% share of transactions in a $15 billion market in the U.S. Second, our technology investments are delivering value. We have enabled new product capabilities and have fundamentally improved our operating and capital expense profile. These capabilities will deliver speed to market for enhancements and new products, margin expansion, and CapEx efficiency. And third, this business simply delivers consistent and durable cash flows. Today, we are trading at an 18% free cash flow yield. We control a greater share of our revenues than ever before and have improved our free cash flow conversion. We are well positioned to grow as the momentum from digital transformation and new products accelerates. Operator, we'll now turn the call over for you for some Q&A. Thank you, sir. As a reminder to ask a question, you'll need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Again, that is star one to ask a question. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. And our first question comes from Ramsey L. Asal from Barclays. Your line is now open. Hi, guys. Thanks a lot for taking my question, and, and congratulations on another solid quarter here. Um, you gave us a good sense about the rest of this year. Could you help us think through uh, 2021, modeling out 2021? Any thoughts, for example, on the current EBITDA consensus of about $275 million in 21? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Ramsey. Um, let me turn it over to Gary to, to uh, start off on that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Ramsey, I, I don't have a crystal ball, obviously, um, but uh, – and we'll officially give guidance in uh, in February, late February probably. But based on current trends of where we are, excluding out those business rates, Q3 we did 60 million in EBITDA. As you can tell, we just discussed approximately 60 million in EBITDA for Q4. If you annualize that, you know you should be right around 240 million in adjusted EBITDA. However, our aspiration obviously is to get probably up to 310 which is what we did uh, close to in, uh, in 2019. But uh, obviously that had about $50 million in um, cross-border uh, revenues in it, and that's very high margin. So we'd really need to see international markets recover soon for that to happen. But if you uh, – consensus you mentioned seems to sort of be right in the middle of those two numbers. So considering we've got new business already contracted, we plan to keep closing the business in the pipeline. We obviously continue to focus on operating efficiencies. So with all that and assuming we get uh, somewhat of a recovery later in the year next year, you know, that, that consensus number seems reasonable to me, uh, Ed. Yeah, I mean, that's, I, I agree. I mean, that, that assumes um, 
you know, some moderate uh, recovery, but that would be in, in the back half of the year. And obviously, uh, cross-border pickup uh, would be uh, would provide more confidence to that. But uh, I think, as Gary is saying, somewhere in the middle uh, there, which is uh, currently close to consensus. Great. That's super helpful. Thanks. Uh, my follow-up is is basically on the competitive environment in general, maybe in the context of the pandemic. I mean, are you seeing smaller ATM deployers, you know, pull back or disappear? I guess how do you expect the marketplace to look kind of when the dust settles, let's say, next year and uh, and uh, just, you know, the impact of the virus on, on, on your competitors? Sure. Um so obviously we'll we'll know in hindsight, uh, you know, next year when we look back and see uh, who's who's left. You know, a lot of the uh, the markets that are smaller, smaller merchants, single locations have been one of some of the places that have been most hit, uh, where some of the smaller operators uh, operate. Uh, so there, you know, could be uh, issues there. Uh, but frankly, where we really uh, operate and our our bread and butter, very large le- retail partnerships. Uh, significant size, scale, uh, and, uh, and product solutions that we bring forth with surcharge free and other solutions, store traffic growth. Um, you know, we are uh, kind of one and, uh, and alone there uh, and continue to see opportunities like the, what we announced this past quarter uh, or about a quarter ago with, uh, with Casey's and Sobeys in Canada. Uh, so feel very strong about that. Um, on the uh, on the FI side uh, of the business, frankly, most of uh, the, the competition there is the status quo. Uh, with you know meeting with financial institutions and talking about you know their needs, and we're able to bring forward a solution and have a, uh, a kind of a solution sale uh, with them and conversation about what they're looking for, whether it's market growth. Uh, cost efficiencies, you know, improving their efficiency ratio, and we have multiple solutions to bring forward, uh, whether that's on demand with surcharge free, marketing through branding, uh, managed services, driving other efficiencies, uh, and we're the only ones who kind of bring to, uh, forth that full suite of solutions to help them in their, their business. That's super helpful. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And our next question comes from Tim Willi from Wells Fargo. Your line is now open. Uh, thank you, and good afternoon. Um, first question is about uh, sort of the FinTech side and obviously the, the new logo with Chime. <clears throat> um, I guess I'm just sort of curious as you pursue these types of contracts and come to these arrangements, you know, there's your perspective of how to position or develop product for all point, et cetera. Has it been altered or evolved? Um, and then just also curious, uh, you, you know, about the plans of these new partners and fintechs in terms of their marketing to their customer base and really getting uh, the activity across the network. I know you've worked a lot with your banks in the last year or two to sort of promote that awareness and what other ways to sort of compare and contrast uh, the, the two different constituents there? And then I had a follow-up. Sure. Um, I, good afternoon, Tim. Um, you know, I, it's it's really uh, it's, it's really interesting because we have clearly, through all point, have become the partner of choice uh, with the fintech community, uh, and really they're, they're a distribution partner. You know, as they've learned about the importance of uh, of cash. And having surcharge-free access to cash that's convenient, conveniently located, like through our network of leading retailers, um, we've become that distribution partner with them uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, and it comes back to that convenient network. The fact that we can customize and tailor the experience at the ATM because we own the network, we own the ATM, and we own the processing platform and can tailor a, a unique uh, relationship uh, and experience for them. Uh, so to the latter, other part of your question about uh, does this uh, inform about other solutions going forward, absolutely. Uh, we have some very uh, some excellent partnerships, tight relationships there, just like we do with traditional financial institutions, uh, but where some of those fintechs want to do some customized um, solutions for uh, their customers to, uh, to engage with them, we can partner with them to do that. Uh, and that's also ties back into, 
you know, why we're really excited about rolling out the Neo Suite uh, uh, solution and uh, platform because um, that allows gives us much more flexibility, much more control to uh, tailor some of those uh, things uh, going uh, going forward. Great. And then my follow up was about the bank side. We're obviously some nice activity there, and as you pointed out, banks are I think more focused on changing the physical footprint they have. Is there anything about the business model in terms of staffing? Um, maybe it would touch the capital intensity. I'm not sure that if this really momentum continues to build, you know, it, it could look like in a 24 to 36 month window, there's a lot of opportunity uh, around the managed services, the outsourcing, that kind of stuff. Is, is there anything we should think about in terms of making that happen if it really were to accelerate? You know, people, saying, tech, you know, just, just anything around the model that you would have to do to make sure you could manage if there was a pretty big acceleration in demand from the bank community. Sure. Um, well, fortunately, you know, that's what we've been hard uh, at work on over the last couple of years, uh, which gets back to that investments in the technology and having uh, the, the proprietary solutions with NEO, uh, as well as changing uh, the operations, integrating our platforms. You know, we've been, you know, very focused on, as we talked about back at our investor day, of integrating our different platforms platforms, making sure the scalability of that, bringing on both surcharge-free solutions as well as managed services. Uh, we're seeing managed service, you know, continuing to pick up, you know, having wins uh, each quarter on that. The pipeline on managed services continues to grow. Uh, you know, initially, it was more, more community than mid-market banks, mid-size, and now some of the largest banks in the country uh, and, frankly, uh, the world. Uh, coming uh, on to that, and uh, I agree that we believe that's going to continue to to grow and accelerate. Uh, I think the other real you know, differentiator there for us is the security, uh, where we've invested heavily in both technology and InfoSec, and we have a terrific InfoSec team on having the security uh, embedded into uh, our platform. I think it's very important with these financial institutions. We will continue to invest in that. Um, and I guess the final comment uh, there is the, the scale where we gave our outlook. Uh, we expect, you know, the key drivers of our growth is one, the surcharge-free network, probably being about half of our growth uh, going forward over the medium term, uh, which scales very nicely. Uh, managed services, probably a quarter of it. Um, you know, that could even be uh, even a higher percentage uh, potentially. But we also implied a fair amount of margin expansion which we've been delivering on. Uh, we were exceeding on that uh, through the end of 2019, through the third quarter, the fourth quarter, accelerating, even the first quarter, accelerating even more with even more margin expansion and organic revenue growth pre-COVID. So, you know, there's really nothing to say of about, you know, what would be uh, significantly different other than continue to scale the business for that opportunity that we see building each quarter. Great. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you. And our next question comes from Peter Heckman from Davidson. Your line is now open. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for taking the question. Um, wanted to know if there's a way that you can help us quantify uh, over the last several quarters, you've announced a number of deals, but trying to quantify the, the, the backlog of, of ATM agreements like the Casey's deal, some of the others, that, that might give us an idea of how many ATMs you have yet to uh, deploy uh, or put in market. And in that same vein, uh, similarly on, on, on branding, you know, how many uh, ATMs do you have contracts that, for branding but, but haven't actually uh, rolled that branding out yet and so that we may not be seeing the revenue in the model? Sure. Let me. I'll start with that, uh, and then turn it over to to Gary to do uh, any uh, other ads. Um, you know, let me start with the second part of that around branding, um, and, and that usually branding arrangements or also or coming on to uh, all point is a fairly uh, can be a fairly short cycle uh, for for those. So I would say that the backlog uh, is uh, is is not uh, not tremendous on that front. Managed services can take longer. Uh, where you would see more of a build uh, over time, and then that is just nice 
durable fixed revenue that builds uh, under under longer term contracts. Uh, we do have a, a fair number of uh, of units um, for um, in in the, the warehouses that are being staged, uh, going out some of the full function uh, that will be going out into the market, uh, you know, later this year and into the, the first quarter. Uh, and clearly, as I mentioned earlier, both Casey's and Sobeys, those rolling out uh, in the U.S., uh, as well as uh, continuing to roll out uh, more in, uh, in South Africa. I think the last point is, right now, things are so murky uh, from the market because of the pandemic, where you still have capacity that's uh, mothballed, hibernated, lack of traffic, lack of consumers moving around. Uh, we have ATMs are just sitting there. Some of them we've just decashed. They're in hibernation. They'll come back on as uh, travel comes back up. So it's kind of hard to say, hey, here's something you should just count on as you think about over the next few quarters until we get to more normalcy. Eventually this will pass, uh, and we'll get back to where people are getting back out and, and, uh, and, and getting back out in the communities and feeling safer. In that time, I think we'd probably give you more of a uh, future pipeline. Yeah, indeed. and obviously we're we're also taking ATMs down. So on a net basis, because you know we're trying to optimize the network in the UK and another region. So you'd actually you know could see declines in numbers of ATMs, but we're also net. It would be would be an addition. Got it. Got it. All right. And then just uh, another question. Um, I haven't had a chance to review the uh, 10Q, although I know it's out. Um, just the the. It, 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 have you changed your estimate of, of, of what the potential total future recoveries could be from the, uh, the UK uh, uh, tax issue? I, if I remember correctly, I thought you had said something like 45, 50 million in a prior filing. Yeah, that was uh, the only difference is, is gross versus net. Um, okay. What you saw last quarter was a gross number, and then what we put in there now is a net number. Um, so just that's. We, we weren't quite sure last quarter what the, the net number sort of percentages would be. We got a little bit more comfortable with a net number. So the number you see now, we recovered 11.8 plus, I believe, the 30 to 31 million is, is, is the remainder left. So that's a net number. Then that's the total amount total that amount. Uh, that it could be. Not the, not We don't know really what all will will come back in. Yeah, assuming okay. we recover 100%. Got it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pete. Yep. Thank you. And our next question comes from Gary Presfapino from Barrington Research. Your line is now open. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Um, Ed, could you, this, with the fintechs that you've signed, and do, do they offer a debit card to every one of their account holders? I'm trying to get an idea of what is the uptake from these account holders on taking a debit card and then do you have any, any way to measure what their usage is vis-a-vis, you know, a traditional brick-and-mortar bank that's issuing these debit cards for the All Point Network? Yeah, and a great, uh, great question. Uh, no, all their members do not have debit cards uh, mm -hmm. uh, on there on the first part. Um, and as, we, as I pointed out earlier, um, they have the volumes we've seen there has grown significantly from the beginning of the year, where our volume now is up 200% uh, from uh, from July. And what we've seen is even throughout this pandemic, uh, month over month volume growth and better engagement. You know, some of their customers, and, and we see this across traditional FIs as well, because each each group, uh, different groups of, uh, of people in their, in their customer profile, but we'll see some that are just heavy engagement. What we do see that's different with the fintechs is they are, um, are highly engaged with their customers. Uh, there's awareness. There's awareness of, hey, here's where you go to all point uh, on the locator search and encouraging people to use that because it's surcharge free and helping them save, uh, save money. So we do see a lot more engagement. And we've seen many of these fintechs growing rapidly. Uh, so as they grow cards, uh, then we obviously have see more opportunity and volume onto the network, and they're also driving more and more engagement. Uh, so it's a, it's a three-way uh, partnership win where we have more accounts, more debit card holders, and more engagement. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. 
And our next question comes from Andrew Jeffrey from Truist Securities. Your line is now open. Hey, guys, good afternoon. Thanks for taking the question. Good afternoon. Uh, so uh, I just, just as a, a matter of, of trying to understand, because I think you've offered a little more disclosure this call than you have in the past about tourist markets, cross-border markets, can you quantify how much revenue is in, maybe in, 19, in 2019 terms, how much revenue is in not only in Europe and in, in cross-border markets, you know, tourist revenue, but also I think, Gary, you mentioned Mexico and Canada are under sort of disproportionate pressure in North America. I'm just trying to gauge you know, how much revenue might be sort of shut in at this point. Well, what, what we've said in the past is that, that the cross-border piece of that was about 4% of revenues, and I think this year, under normal circumstances, we've been tra- we, we're tracking towards 5 um, When you look at what we were talking about, I think the other part of your question is probably about 10% of revenues um, were impacted because of being in the, the tourist market, maybe cruise ships, things like that, or... Um, even just leisure activities themselves, not necessarily travel. Yeah, the, the 10%, and it also goes back to what we mentioned a couple of quarters ago after the onset of the pandemic, you know, as we learned a lot of different things uh, and about how our network <clears throat> really, with a, over 80% of it uh, in, you know, essential locations, but about 10% of our revenues were highly uh, tied to travel, entertainment, leisure, you know, it could be a cruise ship, could be an a amusement park, could be a casino, but also cross-border transactions represent a total of about 10% of uh, revenue exposure. And is it safe to assume that's higher than corporate average margin in aggregate? Um, I would say it's safe to say <clears throat> cross-border uh, transaction opportunities like a DCC is much higher uh, than corporate average. Uh, some locations um, where a um, like a, uh, a casino uh, where it's a very uh, captive consumer right there would be lower than uh, system average. Oh, okay. All right. And then as a follow-up, uh, it's kind of an unfair question, but since you brought it up, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, this, uh, this is my disclosure. Uh, your stock does trade at what appears to be kind of a silly free cash multiple relative to any kind of objective metric. And I think you've done a really nice job uh, managing to free cash flow and managing through pandemic and, and everything else. What can you possibly do just spitballing maybe to change the narrative? <laughs> um, so going going back to the, yeah, yeah, the unfair part, you know, we, you know, continue to uh, execute. We're, you know, you know, outline where we're going, what we've been doing. Uh, we talked about getting back to organic uh, growth uh, back, you know, two years ago, uh, and delivering on that in 2019, accelerating in the organic growth uh, 2019, and accelerating even more so uh, through um, in January and February. Frankly, for the first two months of uh, of 2020, our organic growth consolidated uh, was over 8% uh, and very strong double-digit EBITDA growth. So we have been hitting uh, on all cylinders and executing, and meanwhile, continuing to grow more cash flow. Um, we're a team about hitting singles and doubles every day and executing and delivering consistency and performance and growth and free cash flow. Uh, we've invested in new products and solutions. We'll be rolling out those new products. Uh, over time here that broaden uh, our, our market. I think people will want to see, and like we've been doing, a growing opportunity with financial institutions, uh, which is clearly happening, and we're executing on that, um, and also now evaluating other things that broaden our total addressable market into other transaction opportunities that we can leverage onto our platform. Because what do we have? Uh, we have scale, operating efficiencies that, that scale, a broad network, key convenient locations, and a uh, very valuable digital physical location that can be a multifunction uh, uh, gateway. 
uh, and there will be more, more to come on those type of things. Meanwhile, hitting singles and doubles and growing free cash flow. I mean, you know, as, we, as you started off on that, Andrew, uh, we're sitting here today uh, with a over 18% free cash flow uh, yield uh, uh, on an investment opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank, thank you. And thank you. And our next question comes from Bob Napoli with William and Blair. Uh, thank, you. Good thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon, guys. Uh, may, just uh, as you look at uh, 2021, uh, can you give any thoughts just broadly on what you expect out of uh, the revenue growth out of bank branding and surcharge-free network revenues? You know, you know, Gary walked through uh, earlier based on, um, I think it was Ramsey's uh, uh, a question, just about thoughts uh, on there. You know, I, I guess, Bob, I'd go back to uh, the investor day um, where we looked at uh, the growth uh, of the company going forward uh, over the, on that medium-term outlook. Um, and we sit here today actually more confident about that than we were a year and a half ago uh, because of what we've experienced and what we've learned uh, and that growth in the surcharge-free solutions being all point uh, and branding and that being about half of the growth uh, and, and seeing the, uh, the organic growth there in addition to the managed services. Uh, so we feel um, quite good about that. We just need to get past this period with the pandemic, the uncertainty, the, the murkiness of that and getting people back out uh, and executing on what we saw and as I mentioned earlier, you know, with these changes um, uh, in the market, I believe serves as a catalyst to that same thesis. And the difference is now we've been executing on that thesis, uh, and we've seen that accelerate. So that's, I mean, I'm trying to remember from your investor days. So you're like high single, uh, 50% of your growth, so it's either, you're looking for double-digit growth of bank branding and surcharge-free? Well, we talked about uh, on the investor day then in that outlook that and also Gary talked about earlier was a organic revenue growth of three to five percent in seven to nine uh, EBITDA growth, and now we've dialed down the um, improved the cash flow conversion on the capex side, uh, right. and that three to five organic revenue over the long term uh, was really driven by the surcharge free and uh, manage services, and in particular, that surcharge-free growth scales nicely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Why do you think the U.K. is uh, so much less resilient than the U.S.? Well, I mean, you know, it really comes back to a couple different things. Um, uh, first, you know, our locations are different. We do have uh, more exposure there in the United Kingdom relative to the U.S., more travel, more tourist locations. I mean, frankly, look at London. I mean, the U.K. is, is a highly tourist uh, uh, location, so we've been impacted. That's our largest DCC market uh, in the world. Uh, so that's been more impacted as a result of that to, um, to the EBITDA. So that's nice upside when travel and tourism comes back up. The other real big driver uh, is it's been uh, much tighter in terms of the restrictions uh, through the shelter in place uh, throughout the period since the onset of the pandemic. Whereas in the United States, it's really managed at the state and local level in the municipalities where there may be a shelter in place directive, uh, where we might see a tightening in one community but a loosening in another, uh, which is why it's been so dynamic for us uh, in the U.S. as markets evolve and change. In the U.K., they've locked down, uh, obviously, uh, through uh, through the pandemic, uh, restrictions have been across the country with some easing on that, and now going back down into tightening in, in certain parts uh, of the country. Uh, so it's been much more restrictive uh, from that, which has also had a greater impact on commuting. Uh, you know, a lot of commuting going into London uh, has impacted uh, you know day-to-day -day habits, but eventually uh, you know these things will change and come back around. You, uh, going back to another question on that, though, also um, previous, we've seen the market, uh, you know, capacity coming out of the market. Uh, so as uh, things come back around, 
uh, we believe uh, we're well positioned as uh, activity resume, picks back up because there's less ATM capacity in the marketplace. And then last question, just, uh, I mean, Chime is a real nice signing. Uh, it's really good, really good business, uh, growing very fast. But the revenue that you're getting right now from the fintechs, I know you threw out some very big growth numbers. Is, can you give any, and is that all showing up in the, uh, uh, the uh, the all point in uh, the surcharge free line item. Well, the ones who are partnered with us uh, through all point are um, are in the surcharge free uh, that category with uh, bank branding surcharge free networks uh, plus interchange. Uh, we receive interchange you know predominantly through uh, right. all point uh, in the interchange line. So it shows up in a couple of different areas, uh, and yes, um, that uh, that grows with their growth. Uh, and also their um, their the number of signings there. Now, most of those were also partnering with uh, the other uh, large network. Is that uh, some that? do, um, some do, um, and not sure. Uh, you know specifically, you know where where they are. Uh, right. Our various okay. ones are on that. Uh, but as evidenced by the growth here, the coverage. Uh, clearly, all point has become the, the partner uh, of, of choice, and you know it also comes back again to the question of why is that? Uh, it goes back to that customizable experience where we own the ATM, we own the network, we own uh, the processing capability, so we can customize that experience. And also, we are purely a retail-based network. Uh, that other network you mentioned, most of that's bank to bank, so they would be sending their uh, for the most part, uh, their customers to their competition versus with uh, with all point, you're going to where your customers already are, which is uh, the, the finest shopping places uh, and most convenient locations in the United States. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. And our next question comes from Kartik Meta from North Coast Research. Your line is now open. Hi, gentlemen. Um, Gary, I was wondering, in the past, you've been uh, kind enough to kind of give uh, the trends for a month to, just to get an idea of what's happening. You know, when you gave the September 17th day, uh, an up-to-business update, you gave kind of a uh, an update there on what's a, what was happening in September. I'm wondering if you could provide kind of what you're seeing in terms of October. You're saying on the same store trends? Yeah, just uh, in transactions or just uh, – just, uh, yeah, same store uh, trends or transaction trends, just uh, kind of what you're seeing in October versus what you saw in September. If it's the same, accelerating, decelerating, you know, whatever the case may be. Yeah, so as I mentioned um, in my script that in the U.K., for example, we're sort of leveling out in the, the down 30, you know, low to mid-30s. Um, in, in, the, in the U.S., it's, it's similar to what we discussed uh, on the call for the quarter, you know, sort of flattening out there. I, I wouldn't say it's accelerating right now, but but flattening out right now. That's why when we um, were given the Q4 estimates, we said, you know, assuming current trends, et cetera, no major, you know, release in, in, in population movement and no major lockdowns, uh, just kind of where things are now. Yeah, it looks like where, as Gary said, where we exited and the U.S. being, you know, roughly flat on a year-over-year -year, uh, basis. And then we have periods, it's, it's dynamic. So yeah. It goes up, it goes down um, on a week-to-week -week basis. And then just one last question. Ed, you kind of alluded to this um, in the previous answer. I'm wondering, uh, are the U.K. Uh, lockdowns, I know they've started kind of new lockdowns. I don't know how extensive they are. Is that? Are you seeing any impact yet on the business, or is it just too early to see anything? You know, I think Gary just said, you know, what, what we know right now uh, with what we've seen is it's kind of staying in that, uh, you know, low to mid-30s on a year-over-year -year basis um, at, at that level, and it's been at, at that way for, for a little while. Yeah, Carter, that that's literally up until yesterday. <laughs> so, oh, okay. So okay. low to mid-30%. Perfect. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Carter. Yeah. Thank you. And our next question comes from Steve Comrie from G Research. Your line is now open. Hey, good evening. Um, if I could 
start with the CapEx on, on slide 11. I appreciate that you expect to purchase 3,000 more ATMs in 2020 versus 2019, despite spending significantly less. Maybe just to contextualize this, um, could you give us what the total amount purchased in either year was? And I know, Gary, you mentioned that a lot of the savings from better sourcing, but I was wondering if you could give us like more, a little more tangible detail as to what exactly is costing less or what you guys aren't spending on. Well, you remember when, when we're acquiring machines, they're at all different price points too. So you've always got to take that into consideration. Um, uh, and in prior years, we had other things going on. You know, so I mentioned that you know when we look at capex going forward, it's kind of you know fifty fifty between growth and, and maintenance and infrastructure. In prior years, we had ERP systems going in, et cetera, so that that would have increased the maintenance and infrastructure portion. So that, that's that's one of the reasons why. Obviously, you know, we've we've done a, a lot of work and sort of taken advantage of our global network. That's something that hadn't been done previous years, and we've just started working into it recently. So across the board, when we're purchasing, I mean, we're doing it on a global basis now. Um, Ed already mentioned the Neo Suite and all the technology that's assisting. So it's not one thing; it's multiple things all together that are that are helping to drive that. Okay, appreciate that. And then um, on the on the debt, um, talked about settling the convert with cash in the fourth quarter. Once you get kind of past past the fourth quarter, get past the convert, um, would you expect to continue to pay down debt? And how do you think about other other cash use priorities in the pecking order? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start and I'll pass it over to Ed. Obviously, that's a, a board decision versus mine, but. Um, you know, I, I would think in the near term, our focus is is to get into that range, that two to two and a half times that we mentioned. Um, I think you know it, it'll be close on the edge by by the end of the year. I'm hoping we're inside of it um, if things keep, keep continuing to to progress. Uh, and then at that point, I think we'll have to start you know thinking about things once we get into the range. Uh, but we still have a little ways to go there. Yeah, it's a board discussion, and uh, we'll be discussing uh, that uh, with uh, with the board. You know, upcoming. Uh, uh, meetings in the future. Um, the important part is the business is generating a lot of free cash flow. Uh, it's very durable and even through a pandemic uh, demonstrated very strong, consistent free cash flow generation, which just gives a lot of confidence uh, and the confidence that we have in, in the outlook in the business. And uh, we're on the doorstep of being back into that range and gives us a lot of option. Uh, and we'll be back more to talk about that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Reggie Smith from J.P. Morgan. Your line is now open. Good evening. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Most of them have been hit. Um, I had one point of clarification, and you may have mentioned this, but I wanted to make sure. Uh, looking at um, in your supplement, you, you kind of break out uh, I believe it's called other ATM expenses, and that was down considerably sequentially. And I was curious. I believe that's that tax rebate issue in the UK, but I wanted to to verify that. Um, and then I guess maybe get a little clarity. It, it sounds like you're expecting a similar or maybe a slightly larger benefit next quarter. Um, so just clarity on that would would be helpful. So just to be clear, you're talking about the the other expenses in the ATM operating expenses line going from 18 to three. Yeah, that one. Yeah, so so that is that is the the UK business rates would have would have flown through those lines before, um, and this year obviously it is it is a reverse expense if you think about it. Um, so that that's that's one of the reasons. Right, and, and and so when you talked about the fourth quarter and you gave kind of a sixty million dollar EBITDA baseline, but then you you grossed that up for something. Is that? Um, yeah. That growth that, that, of that exactly okay. right. And, so, 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 just to recap, in, in Q3 we had you know EBITDA of, of close to 72 million, and and close to 12 million of that was this you know UK business rate recovery. So the base underlying business generated 60 million in in adjusted EBITDA. And what I said is, I think we're expecting in Q4 to run a similar rate on the underlying business, which is 60, 
but we expect to recover even a little bit more of the business of the business the UK business rate. So more like 15 to 20. So that would be a total EBITDA of 75 to 80. Got it. Is that is that um, as we think about 21? Does that go away or or? Um, no, there's still there's, that was the question that was asked earlier. You know, there's we we have 11.8 in the books, right? Uh, and then you'll see in the the queue that we said there'd be a, another approximately 30 million um, that is remaining. So if we got to the top end of that range of 20, we would still have another 10. And that's assuming we collect everything. Um, and, and but as I mentioned in my script, that you know so far we've been having really good luck um, with recovery. So okay. but that would be up, right. upside, uh, but not not yeah. not counting on yeah that. yeah. Sure. And then, and then uh, one last question, and you guys have kind of, um, it's been asked, I guess, a few times, but not really explicitly. But I hear you talk about the um, free cash flow yield in the business. I, I hear that the free cash flow conversion is improving. Um, you've bought back $67 million in stock previously, and obviously you're trying to clean your balance sheet out of the debt. Um, Ignoring the board, just between us five here on the call, uh, <laughs> you know, how, do, how do you guys, like if, if it were up to you, I mean, I'm looking at the stock price, um, you know, thinking about things that can improve the narrative, I think a share repurchase and even maybe even management uh, purchase of stock would, would probably go a long way to, to, um, to you know, show a sign of confidence. I'm going to leave that there and let you, let you guys respond to it. Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, both, uh, Gary and I have been, uh, buyers in the stock. Obviously, we're in blackouts. Um, but from a, a, a repurchase standpoint, clearly, uh, you know, we've been there before, uh, pre pandemic. We had an ongoing, uh, stock repurchase, uh, on an opportunistic basis, uh, there. So obviously, uh, the board has, has had that comfort and you know, we've, um, consistently deleveraged back into that range. And as I mentioned earlier, we're on the doorstep uh, on that. We will review various uh, uh, alternatives, <clears throat> which could include repurchases, could include dividends, could include other things. Uh, obviously, we, we looked at uh, a, a lot of different things, but I think there's a consistent track record there, a focus uh, on uh, delivering that and the focus on the shareholder value uh, creation. And right now, as you point out, as I said before, we're sitting here with an 18% uh, free cash flow yield uh, with, uh, with good confidence, uh, even though we are still in uh, a pandemic. But we've demonstrated, this business has demonstrated the consistency and the durability. Um, we're sitting here now also with better visibility uh, and control of our revenues and, uh, and free cash flow conversion. So we look forward to talking about that uh, at the board. Uh, but also back up with investors and um, and uh, keeping you uh, updated. Sure, perfect. If I if I could sneak one last question, uh, Bob had asked earlier about the UK, and I was just curious. Um, so it sounds like there's there's definitely a little more tourism there, and that's uh, something that can kind of snap back. But if if we were to compare that to New York, is, would you say the trends in the UK are similar to? what you see in New York City, um, or would there even be differences there between the two? Because I would imagine um, New York probably looks and feels a lot like the U.K., but I wasn't sure. It, it, uh, New York, um, earlier in the pandemic, um, it, it's interesting you, you, you raised New York. So like New York, if I go back to pre-pandemic uh, period in the first quarter uh, and the, 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 the end of last year and going into the first quarter, uh, contrary to what some alleged uh, in the market, you know, concern with, you know, uh, tap rolling out at the subway and, and concerns uh, around what that can mean, that was one of our strongest markets in the country. I mean, literally one of the strongest markets with the growth we've seen. And why is that? It's because partnering with the core financial institutions, partnering with them, branding locations, joining all point, and serving those customers' needs and the growth we saw that at our key retail partnerships uh, in New York is one of our strongest ones. Then, obviously, with the pandemic, uh, it went to one of the worst ones uh, in the shelter in place. That's come back around uh, and see uh, it can be we have weeks where it's very, very uh, attractive. So that's that's come back uh, quite considerably. Uh, the U.K. has been a different, you know, different market, obviously, with the 
with the commuting issues um, and there and also the tighter restrictions, uh, it, has, uh, it has been uh, more, more impacted there. Uh, and then also with the uh, the travel coming into what was anticipated historically there into London uh, from a tourism standpoint. Um, but we would expect that to come back around as well. New York has been very dynamic, you know, periods recovered, some periods down, uh, it's just been dynamic. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Reggie. And thank you. I would now like to turn the call back over to Ed West, Chief Executive Officer, for closing remarks. All right. Well, we just thank you very much. Thank you for your interest uh, in the company, and we look forward to keeping you posted and, uh, and updated uh, and uh, speaking to you uh, next quarter. Uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.